Hi there, friends. Welcome to another TechSoup Connect Western Canada event. I'm delighted to have you here joining us for this exciting event about automation. We're going to explore how automation can revolutionize nonprofit operations, reduce staff burnout, definitely a problem none of us have ever had to worry about, and strengthen donor relationships. We're going to discover practical automation strategies that save time and allow you to focus on what truly matters, the personal connection with donors and with the, the people and clients you serve. To help us with that, we brought in an expert, Dan Lombardi from Mission Simplify. So Dan has a decade of expertise in the nonprofit sector, a business administration degree, and a postgraduate diploma in fundraising and volunteer management. Dan is currently the VP of Solutions at Grand River Hospital Foundation. And outside of that office, he helms Mission Simplify, a platform that he started as a modest newsletter. And, and it's now a beacon for nonprofits eager to adopt unconventional tech solutions and amplify their impact. At Mission Simplify, Dan turns exper experimentation into enlightenment, helping organizations like yours streamline operations and supercharge their mission. We're going to learn a lot today. And with that, let me pass the baton over to Dan. Welcome to my presentation about automation and empowering nonprofit. Let me get started here. Just a little bit about myself. So as you said, I'm Dan. I currently work for Grand River Hospital Foundation, which is actually located in Kitchener, Ontario. You're probably wondering how I got involved in the Western Canada chapter of TechSoup. I currently actively reside most of my time in Alberta. It's a very long story, which I won't get into, but if you have questions about it afterwards, let me know. But yeah, it's funny. I did set up Mission Simplify just on the side. Originally, it was just a newsletter to share some of the cool things I had done at my current job and evolved into then helping other nonprofits, sharing some of the things that we were able to help, I was able to help them do. And so, yeah, just a fun place to to do some experimentation. And I just my email address here. You can literally email me at any time this way. I'm open. A pretty open book. Um, so depending on what questions you have at the end of today's presentation or what I did, or you just need help with something, feel free to reach out. It's not going to cost you anything unless you actually want to work long-term with me. I'm always happy to answer questions and share everything I get to work on. So today I'm going to run you through three fun automations and I'll touch base on a couple other ones that were built with similar concepts to this, these ones. So essentially integrating any CRM uh, using CSV files. And there's a reason for that to an email or a ring list voicemail automation or a combination of both. Updating Facebook custom audiences. So for many nonprofits, Facebook ads are a very inexpensive way to try and reach new people. Oh. And so there's an easy way to just turn on autopilot and update to custom audiences if you've used them before. If not, no worries, I'll touch on it briefly and basically get into being able to connect with more people based on who has given back to you. And then a cool one that I did at my current job, just around sending some heartfelt thank you emails post donation and how we were able to automate that and, and segment our donors. And so as I'm getting into this, I will use the word automation a lot, but what I want to drive home is that when I am talking about automation, what I'm really trying to talk about is efficiency. And so anything that you automate, the idea behind it is to help save you time. Many nonprofits, yes, we definitely have, can have high turnover rates, staff burnout. You might be tasked with being the fundraiser at the organization that you work at, but we all know that just because you have a fundraiser doesn't mean you have a million other things to do. And the actual amount of time you spend fundraising is a lot lower than probably other staff or even your board if you report directly to them. And so the whole premise behind automation is to build efficiencies for yourself to give you back time to make sure that you can feel like you have a life outside of work or a life at work, depending on what's happening. And so when I say the word automation, sometimes I do mean automation because we're using technology, but really what I want to drive home is that we're trying to make your life more efficient. Um, so one thing to keep in mind here, and this is just like a general question, if you want to put answers in the chat, you can, but you don't have to. But basically, if you think about when you might receive a donation at your current organization, how much time do you spend crafting a thank you email or how much time do you want to spend crafting a thank you email, especially if you want to make it personal? And then how many donations per week might you get in that time span. Uh, I read a stat somewhere once, I think it was that if you're actually like gonna sit down, maybe check the donor record in your donor CRM, then perhaps craft an email around like, all right, I know how much you've given in the past, some of the things you've given to, and then actually get down to write that email and then press send, it might take you upwards of around 11 minutes. Now, let's say you get 50 donations a week, even 100. 
that's a whole lot of your time just sending thank you emails, for example. And so obviously it can be quite, quite time consuming just to try and stop and, and make those donors feel like you're connected. In many organizations, uh, what I have found, and it's probably similar in places you currently work or where you've worked in the past, as always, major gift donors, however you choose to define them, takes the bulk of your time. Yet all the other donors that you deal with uh, are equally important and they want to feel like they're part of your community or that you've properly acknowledged the donation that you've made or they've made, sorry. Um, by doing that at some point down the road, you never know, they could turn into a legacy donor. They could call you out of the blue and suddenly make a major donation. Uh, by building in some automations or efficiencies into your workflow, you actually might be able to connect them more. I know at one point we did an experiment at Grand River where we actually tried to email every single one of our donors that we had an email on file for that was like a current donor. So donation recurring the past 12 months on a monthly basis through a one-to-one -one process. We had about 10,000 donors to email. You can imagine how much time that would take if we did it manually, but we were able to build a process using some automations and tools that actually only took us about 20 to 30 minutes a month to then send those one-to-one -one emails to donors. Sometimes we got replies, sometimes we didn't. That really didn't matter to us. The point of it was we wanted those donors to feel like they were receiving or just as important as the person that gave us the large gift. Some of the tools that I use here or that we'll talk about today. So I use Zapier for a lot of stuff. That is like the tool that I love the most. It is essentially an app that allows you to connect to various other web applications. And so two applications that you don't think should have any relation whatsoever, you can usually connect through a tool like Zapier. It might seem scary to use at first, but it is pretty much low code. It's a lot of drag and drop, just drop down menus to ask it to do certain things for you. There's a couple of specific tools in there that are very helpful. So formatter and looping by Zapier, which I'll get into in a couple of examples. Google Workspace is a big one. Microsoft Outlook also works obviously pretty well, depending on if which one you use. Both of them work essentially equally well. I should say Slide Broadcast is a fun one that I've used before. So that one kind of lets you send out ringless voicemails and it has a very low cost. So if you have a very small technical budget and want to reach a whole bunch of people via the phone by leaving them a ringless voicemail, basically, it is cheap. A hundred ringless voicemails is going to cost you about 10 US dollars. So not a lot of money. One organization that I helped, they ran a fundraising breakfast or they run a fundraising breakfast every year. And historically in the past, what they did is they would invite donors or supporters to come to the fundraising breakfast. They would follow up with uh, phone calls to ensure that they were going to appear on the fundraising breakfast. All donors knew that the fundraising breakfast was actually a place where they were going to be asked for money, basically. So that intention was made up front. But to ensure that they had enough people there, there was a lot of staff time and follow up to call people. And they changed that process by essentially running an automation that ran through Zapier and some Sly broadcast stuff and sent out the ringless voicemails on their behalf from a staff member. And they, it worked out great for them because it saved them a whole bunch of time of dialing the number and talking. It left the voicemail in terms of what information was important, it left the callback number because you do have to include an actual phone number for people to call you back at. And essentially then when people were able to call back, sometimes it was like, oh, hey, I got a call and this number from you, what were you calling about? And they were actually able to connect with more people. So it did save them quite a bit of time. Constant contact, for example, but obviously like any, obviously email tool works well. These are just in terms of the example I'm going to show you today. So if you use MailChimp, again, all tools like that would connect through Zapier, Facebook, and then a funky tool called HTML Cleaner which is basically if you want to write an email and you don't know anything about coding, it will essentially let you write an online Word document. It's totally free of charge and give you the code that you might need to paste into an email. Uh, and this will essentially allow you to include like images or links if you want to make the, any email seem more fun or personalized. Okay. Hey, so I'm just going to talk about, sorry, CRM, sorry, email and voicemail. Basically, this is a big one. Uh, most nonprofits, a lot of nonprofits, we all use different CRMs or databases. And depending on which database you use, there are some that actually connect directly to Zapier with some limitations. There's some that don't connect at all. There's some that have great reporting and some that you can argue, hey, I don't love the reporting. For example, and some I know you might be able to build a report in advance and schedule it to send to you all the time. And others, you always have to go in and manually pull it. It just depends. But one that I find really helpful is just so long as you can extract data from your donor database into a CSV file, essentially you can build an automation by doing the initial data pull from 
your own database, obviously that would allow you to include certain parameters on your queries, making sure that you recruit people who maybe were marked as deceased or people who have opted out of receiving communications from you. All of that important stuff, it's pretty achievable. So an easy one, not easy, but a, a common one or one thing to think about would be like, hey, how many new donors do I get this week? Can I pre-build a report around number of new donors in the week? Have that automatically sent to me and then build an automation from there. So one that I helped to build was essentially through the donor database. I don't believe the donor database had scheduling, if I remember correctly, but we were able to essentially have a report built in the donor database. The person would manually basically go in and pull a report each week. We would then have them mail, email, sorry, that report as a CSV in the format that they set it up for in their database. So obviously there's a bit of upfront work to a customized email address. That customized email address would then read it via Zapier. It would be able to extract the data. It would format and loop the data. So essentially, if date appeared in one format, it can change the date. If email looks a little funky, it can reformat email. So there are basically some formatting things that you can go through. And then by looping, essentially what's happening is that spreadsheet contains like 10 rows of data, for example. The automation through Zapier is going to make sure it reads every single one of those rows individually, as opposed to lumping them all together. So it's essentially repeating the process for each row of data. It would then, uh, based off of each loop or line item in the spreadsheet, create an email that was either a draft for a staff member to review so they could review the email before it's sent. Or if you want to be real adventurous, which is usually my recommendation, um, you can have an email send automatically. From there, within the automation, we were able to create an additional waiting period. So essentially a delay step, for lack of a better term. And then we would send a ringless voicemail to the donor thanking them. So again, this would be used, or this example would have been used for like new donors. So why we were essentially looking for a specific donor segmentation is because one, if they're a new donor, then that email that you're going to write or craft in step three here is basically going to probably be the same for all of them. It's most likely going to be like, hey, thanks for supporting our organization for the first time. This might be some additional information you want to know about us. In a lot of cases, nonprofits do already have the content written and built, but they're currently taking the time to manually send it, depending on what's happening. From there, like I said, it would create a waiting period and then it would send said ringless voicemail to a donor, again, because we've segmented them based off of certain, certain parameters, like getting new donors, that ringless voicemail, the messaging can be pretty standardized. Because of how the ringless voicemail works, you can't make it as personal as data that might be contained in this CSV file. So for example, through a ringless voicemail, it's hard to use something like donor name. So I couldn't have a voicemail, although Slide Broadcast has added some of that functionality to personalize it. I have not tried it yet. It would be hard to be like, hey, I mean, this initial one, hey, Dan, thank you for becoming a first time donor versus in an email, because something like first name can be pulled into a data file. That information is actually really easy to include. So that's how that one worked. I know I'm going to share the slides with Eli afterwards, and there's a link to like the template. So if you do ever want to try this yourself in Zapier, you can essentially copy the template. Sorry, I'm soon. Of a, of a power flow there going on. And so I've got a question here coming in from Ben, who's saying, so is this particular process, is it clear to the end user that this is automated? Is that all really transparent Good. why you're not using just the standard newsletter tool for this? Good question. Uh, so to answer Ben's question, no, it wouldn't be clear to the end user that it's not automated. Oh, no, thank you for prompting me because that brings up a good point. It's a fair question, right? Yeah, and it's an no, important one too. It's totally a fair question. And in some instances, obviously, it's a totally separate topic, obviously. Let's say you're using AI generated content. I would totally say, hey, yes, you should probably include a disclaimer in your emails to say something about this was AI generated. In this case, no, we didn't do that. And the reason being is because, like I said, this is not much different than a traditional, like very traditional old school nonprofit form letter in that. Like I said, if someone has made a donation to you, you probably have a standardized thank you email that you send to most of those people. And you are most likely taking the time right now to copy and paste it out of some sort of Word document into an email and pressing send. And then the reason why we send it this way as opposed to through something like MailChimp or some email marketing 
tool like Constant Contact is because we do want it to make it look like the staff member took the time to write the email. And it's not that they didn't take the time to write the email because at some point someone wrote that email. It's just the process to actually then paste it into the email and send it has become automated. And so you could argue with me that, yes, that might appear disingenuous. And so you might not want to do this. And I totally get and respect that. I would never mm-hmm. tell you, oh, no, you should do it that way. Let's, I know that was more so the reasoning behind it. The other reasoning behind it is because of how it sends. So in this example here, it would have sent through Gmail. Like I said, Outlook would also work under the same parameter. Because we send it this way, what's going to happen is this would be no different than you actually taking the time to email a donor or you taking the time to email your mom or a colleague. It's going to show up in their inbox versus if you email someone via MailChimp or Conference Contact. Because those are actual email marketing tools, if the person you're sending an email to does use Gmail personally, what's most likely going to happen with that email is it's going to end up in a promotions folder or a uh, updates folder or something and not actually in their inbox for them to see unless they're actively seeking it out. And so in this case, we're saying, okay, no, we want to avoid that promotions folder altogether. So essentially it's it's like you taking the time to write it yourself, just maybe a whole bunch of time. Like if you have 15 donors in a week, how much time is that actually going to take you to write 50 emails to 50 donors in this case? So that that was more so the reasoning behind it. Does that help answer your question as to why we did it that way? Yeah. And I was going to say, I won't, I'll put this in the chat, but it's another question that's going to be asked next. I've been with all our AI topics recently for me as a co-host and Eli Eli and I co-hosting events involving AI is someone's going to ask you the chat GPT question, right? Because they're going to ask you how you generated that content to get there. Yeah. Um, And the chat GPT question is a whole bunch of questions, including things like automating your content, but also can you make it sound even less automated? Yes. No. You like to answer your question. There's no unsubscribe link correct in the way this one was sent because it is, it's, it's honestly no different than you opening whatever email tool you use, clicking compose to write a new email and typing out the email. In this case, though, the text is just generated in advance. And then the steps in terms of, hey, who am I sending this to? That list is generated by the CRM. It's now run through a loop in Zapier, that content or email that I was likely going to send them. So there's some personalization that can't work as well, obviously. Um, If you really want to personalize it, this isn't necessarily for you. But if you're willing to keep it somewhat broad enough, and if you, whatever message you originally craft, you maybe only tweak slightly for donors, then this essentially will save you a whole bunch of time. The ringless voicemail is a little bit more obvious that it's being run through some sort of tool just because people are like, oh, I don't know how I missed a call. Why do I have a voicemail? Whereas the email one, no, it does essentially look like you, you've taken it. So like, like I said, if you think that's disingenuous, I've never fault anyone for thinking that. But the intention behind it was definitely to save time. In that case, in terms of ChatGPT, yes, there are ways to automate with ChatGPT. So you can, you can through Zapier, connect to some advanced, to connect to ChatGPT. And if you want to, you could actually send some data to ChatGPT, have it write you an email, then take the copy, pop it into the email and send it. I've never done that. Usually in this case, it's actual email content that we're writing with the organization because they know what the message is going to be. You're probably going to want to change it every now and then, depending on what you're actually fundraising for in that time. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do that one. So on a similar vein, an automated thank you one. So this is one that we actually did at my current job. And so if you use an online gift process tool, most likely what's going to happen is someone makes a donation. They are likely receiving a static automated email message from you anyways to thank you with your tax receipt attached. So for example, I know you receive donations through Canada Helps because you're a small nonprofit. You're pretty limited in terms of what information you can change or how that email looks. A lot of other online, like CRM platforms, you might have some customization, but not necessarily a whole lot. Where I currently work, we are a little unique in that we run all of our stuff through Shopify, which is an e-commerce platform. Um, But it does allow us to essentially create some better automations and workflows for doing crazy things like this, for lack of a better term. So in this case, I included a screenshot of this one which um, might be difficult to read, but essentially on our website that uses Shopify, we have products and products are donations, but we actually also sell physical products and then event tickets and do a whole bunch of other stuff. And based on how we set up those products in Shopify, they might be coded a certain way. So memorial donations, in this case, you can see in the screenshot, we have a second purchase because Shopify will tell us the number of times they've made an online purchase or donation to us. 
And so what we did is we created an automation where if someone, if a, there's a new order on Shopify, that new order is essentially a new purchase based off of what they purchased or ordered. So you, like I said, we would ha we have a way to differentiate between physical products and donation products. There was a filter to then say, okay, if this is a donation product, continue. If it's a physical product, don't continue. So essentially stop the automation. You're not sending an email to someone. If they made a memorial donation, because again, that's a specific product on our website. Again, there's some path rules that says here. So basically we're setting up an additional filter to say, hey, did they donate or purchase this specific item in Shopify? If yes, you can continue. If no, again, stop the automation. We would then delay for a set amount of time because what we didn't want, and in this case, you could definitely argue with me, then that this might seem disingenuous, but we didn't want is they didn't want the email to send within two minutes of the online transaction being processed. If we did it that way, then for sure it's obvious that it's an automation, but in this case, we put in a delay, I think of one hour, basically to make it appear like a staff member took the time to email them back. And what we were doing here is one, we just sent them a specific thank you about making a memorial donation. And then two, letting them know, okay, because you made a memorial donation, if you do want to notify the family you've made a donation on their behalf and you missed it when donating online, Here's the link to like some free um, in memory cards and e cards that you can send through our website, stuff like that. The other ones in the screenshot here, you can see that they're labeled second purchase and third purchase. So essentially, they've made more than one online donation or purchase with us. So, based off of that, we might write a different email because they already know who we are, but they're returning. And so, we might want to do something fun in how those emails work. And then we were able to just turn this on and have it run. And because of how we filtered it, I think. I don't remember ever getting a complaint of, from someone indicating that they received a duplicate email or the same email twice. That could happen. Obviously, one of the criteria for online donations, obviously, is like email address. And so in theory, someone can make a donation with two separate email addresses, which means they would end up receiving the same email twice. But again, this is an email that we would have wrote in advance and then modified as we needed to, depending on time of year month, et cetera. So all we're really doing then is we're just updating this automation once for the email copy and then letting it run for like a set amount of time until we choose to update the email copy again. So I figured you might want to have a little bit of fun. So I'm just going to give me one second. I'm just going to in the chat, if you actually want to see it in action, I'm going to give you a link to a, on, an online forum. Because again, why not have a little bit of fun? If you want to fill out the online form with your name and select your favorite type of pizza, nothing too crazy, I will automatically email you a pizza recipe while we're done with this call. Because obviously I'm talking to you and I won't actually have time to send an email to all of you that is specific to your pizza of choice. So give me one second just to pull it open. I thought I could copy the link easier and I cannot. So hold on one second. And I will put this in the chat. Uh, yes, I do use Zapier essentially to run a lot of the automations, but there are alternatives besides Zapier. Um, so you can use Microsoft Power Automate. I've used that one before. That one I find it can be quite technical, not easy to use if you don't understand what it's asking for. Uh, in some cases, you definitely need some coding experience. There's another good one. I believe it's called Make, M-A-K-E. Uh, and I think they have, they're similar to Zapier. And essentially what I said, like I said, what Zapier does is it's going to take data from one application. So in the example, I'll just go back. I'll pop, hold on, I'll pump the form in here if you want to actually test an automation. So in this example here, this is all run through Zapier. But what it's essentially doing is it's taking data from Shopify, which is the step at the top. It's then filtering it through some Zapier filtering, then further filtering it, then creating a delay, which is essentially a free Zapier product, and then sending an email through Gmail. In reality, Shopify and Gmail don't actually talk to each other. But a tool like Zapier then allows them to talk to each other. Zapier does have nonprofit pricing. I think it's like 25% off. Thank you, I guess, make.com. I think Zapier's pricing is like 25% off. I believe Make might be slightly cheaper when I started on Zapier and I've just never switched. But I think Make is slightly similar. I think I did look into it, but I already had so much stuff built in Zapier that I didn't actually want to go ahead and rebuild everything. And in terms of like how their pricing structure works in Zapier, it's based off of number of what they call zaps or tasks. And it can be like pretty cheap. Like it starts at, I think, 25 bucks a month for 700 tasks. So depending on how many 
depending on how many things you want to run, like I said, just a very basic, hey, I want to email some people. That, that's pretty cheap. To Ben's previous question, and I don't have a screenshot of it here, but a, a very simple one that we have in Zapier. So it's considered an automation in Zapier. We always have it turned off, and then we only turn it on when we want to use it, is we do have one at my current job. And I've shared this one with a couple of charities, is where the automation or trigger at the top, if you're looking at Zapier, so similar to the screen you looked at here, the trigger at the top is new row added to spreadsheet. And this, it's only two steps. And the second step is send an email. And again, where we've used this one in the past and other organizations have used it is, let's say, again, you have sent out your MailChimp or marketing email to your whole donor database for an upcoming event. And you haven't necessarily got a huge response because they're marketing emails and people might choose to ignore them. And so a recent one we did at Grand River was we were hosting or helping run a 20th anniversary cancer event. So we emailed literally everyone to be like, hey, here's our weekly newsletter. Yeah, we have an open house cancer event. You can meet cancer docs and learn about how it works, et cetera, celebrate the team. And then we took a separate subset of anyone who had given to cancer within 12 months, for example. We ran them through this other automation, and then they all received an email via Gmail from a staff member on the team, personally inviting them to the cancer open house event. So again, that same staff member could have, we could have pre-written that email for that staff member. They could have worked their way through the spreadsheet one at a time, pressing send to all those 1,000 people, or we can just automate it automatically. And so that automation or efficiency, we, we keep it turned off at all times, and then we update it periodically. So we'll go in, we'll change the email copy, basically. And then usually once the automation is run, we just delete all the data from the spreadsheet that we loaded up into. So the spreadsheet is always empty and clean just to make our life a little bit easier. So then we know who it was sent to. Within Zapier, you can see who it was sent to and, and download audit trails and all that stuff. But like I said, this was essentially allowing us to say, hey, let's invite cancer specific donors. And if we do have to do this one at a time, we're going to need 10 staff members, each being assigned to 100 people, each taking the same email copy, each copying it, pasting it, pressing send. Here's a way that we can do it in all of 15 minutes, give or take. This is it's pretty impressive because I have been the automation machine for the sending out the 100 that's slightly customized emails using like text expansion tools. But even with that, I'm still at a minute per email at my very best. And by the end, I have very grumpy riff. So in this case, like I said, if you fill it out, name, email, I did include phone number in there and I'll happily have it prompt to send you a hilarious ringless voicemail later today that just says, hey, it's Dan. I hope you got my pizza recipe, I think is what the voicemail is. But like I said, it, it's just for you to be like, oh, this does work or oh, I think I hate this. But it's interesting. So you can clearly see my hand if you are filling it out and you get an email from me in the next five minutes, then that is the automation working as it's supposed to. But I guess I should maybe also be logged into that to check to make sure it's working as it's supposed to. Okay. So I'll continue on. Uh, let me just report my, my presentation here. Okay. Yeah, nice okay. Facebook custom audiences. So this one is pretty straightforward for a lack of term. It's only two steps. Like I said, if you're a nonprofit and you do ever want to run ads, there's a lot sometimes that we can complain about with social media. Facebook ads are relatively inexpensive. They give you pretty good ability to set your parameters in terms of what type of people you're looking to connect with. So people in your geographic region, if you're like a small community organization, people that already like your page, et cetera. Within a Facebook business, like the business suite, you can create custom audiences. And so all a custom audience really is, hey, I want to target these specific people when I run an ad. Basically, to custom audiences, you can upload your email list. If you've never done this before and want to know more, like I said, send me an email, I'll happily show you how to do that or tell you, give you the steps to do that. That's no problem. Basically, where this becomes handy is if you're running a holiday campaign, for example, or like the summertime campaign when Facebook ads are maybe even a little cheaper and you want to try to reconnect with your donors that I've already given to you by creating a custom audience with your email record, you can target those people specifically. And then ideally, if the email that they use to donate to you is also the email they use for Facebook or Instagram, and I don't totally know how it works with WhatsApp, I haven't tried that, but Facebook or Instagram, at least, you'll be able to target them for donations where this also becomes handy. And because Facebook allows you to create cuss lookalike audiences, which is essentially you saying, hey, I've already created an audience that I think worked for me. I want to create an audience that looks like this audience. So maybe not people on your email list, but people that might 
have similar demographics to them and create ads for them. And so basically this one was a very straightforward one. We had basically new email signups through constant contact via donation or a newsletter signup when they had consented to marketing, um, basically their email was added to the Facebook custom audience. So that way the person, if they ever wanted to run Facebook ads in the future, they would know that custom audience was always up to date. They would never have to remember the step to go pull an email list, upload it to Facebook, target those people specifically. Like I said, that one is just like a, a pretty simple time saver, more so than that. Like it might be something that you don't do that often. Maybe you only run ads like on a quarterly or yearly basis, and you might not realize that you could do this. This way you can ensure that audience list. If you do choose to target them with an ad, it's always up to date. Not too crazy, but yeah. And that was sort of it. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I just want to think. Okay. So I guess that was sort of it for the automations. Uh, like I said, um, when I talk about automations, it's more sort of about efficiency. And so on our, my website, I did, um, and this one I learned that I had to use chat GPT to help me out because I am not a, a true coder. Uh, but on my website, I did create a couple like ROI calculators on there. And one of them will tell you, I think it uses the metric that I found of $11 to, or sorry, 11 minutes to send a thank you email. It will tell you like how much time you can save just by automating them. Uh, yes, there's obviously like some setup time, but usually once it's set up once and someone can understand how it works or you understand how it works, it's pretty easy to change email content. Changing email content once takes way less time than sending, like I said, 50 emails and should save you like a whole bunch of time. And there's a couple other fun calculators on there where if like you realize how much time you actually spend uh, writing these emails or how much time you think another staff member on your team might spend writing these emails versus how much their salary is, then, oh, you can actually apply those cost savings, not to fire the person. That's not what I'm getting at, but what they're doing with their time somewhere else. And so the biggest thing that we talk about, or when I talk to other nonprofits about this is it, like, you don't want computers. Like I know the fear with things like chat GPT is, oh, it's going to take someone's job. In this case, what we're really trying to do is, hey, what takes up a whole lot of your time? that you hate doing or just literally takes up too much time and what could you better use that time for? And so why we focus on thank you email in this case is one, because it was pretty easy to do because all we need is an email address and to know what you donated to. Two, all the time that a staff member might take to write that thank you email. One, it's already done for them. So an initial reach out to a donor has now already happened for them. Three, whatever time they save doing that, they could actually spend that time now actually trying to make a personal phone call or taking a donor meeting or maybe updating the CRM with notes from a donor meeting, which I know doesn't always happen how we want it to. Oh, no, uh, that one thing will, that will never, <laughs> ever happen. <laughs> That's something that will never happen. And so basically what we wanted to do is it's not to replace the human contact. That's why thank you emails are an easy one. They can be somewhat broad and generic. And like I said, we have built a couple that are slightly more specific. But using that time saving, it should then give our staff time to be like, hey, you know what? I no longer have to email these people or I don't have to email these people in bulk because I know it's just going to happen to invite them to the cancer event. Yes, I can now go to three donor meetings today because I don't have to sit around and email 300 people to invite them to an open house. So yeah, that's the easier way to think about it. So what's your what's your trade-off with your time once you're able to, to automate some of these things? So these are just some examples. Like I said, I've automated a whole bunch of other stuff from financial processes to some other things that just take up too much of people's time. So, but yeah, no, that's all I wanted to share with you today. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully it wasn't too technical or confusing, but like I said, if you ever have questions, feel like free to email me at any time and I'm more than happy to answer your questions and just send you in the right direction. And it looks like on your slides, there are actual links in there to the recipes, basically templates that could be followed or adapted. Yes. Yeah. So I, so anything I set up here, like I included, Eli can send out the link and we'll include, there's a link to the template. So if you do sign up for Zapier, you can literally copy it and then it would allow you to enter your own Gmail credentials, for example, or at least you can see how it's set up and then you could swap Gmail or Outlook if you use that instead. It doesn't ever include the text that we would use, for example, but it does at least give you an idea of what's happening. And to answer your question, is there a company or person that does these titles for NPOs? I guess that person is me in terms of, if there's another company that you find do this, I would love to talk to them, but I, it's very hey, I, yeah. I just see a business opportunity, yeah. I know that's why. And I know how great your work is because we did our discussion mm -hmm. to prep for the um, meeting today and I wrote the copy for the email campaign. So 
Yeah, I know. Always it's not, trying to support you. No, thank you. It's not common. I, yeah, thank you for catching myself because I'm very bad at doing that. So yes, if you do want help and want to work with me, because this is, you know, I love this stuff. I think it's so much fun and cool. I will never charge any nonprofit a lot because I also know how nonprofit budgets work. And I know, yes, you can pay me some of my time. But once you're set up, that's where the time savings is for everyone involved. And yeah, no, it's more amount of, if you by chance come across another consulting firm that does this, I would be like surprised. Right. It's right. not very common, at least for nonprofit. I've talked to others and I explained to them some of the stuff we did and they thought I was a little crazy. Right. So if you think I'm crazy, that's okay. Have I used specific nonprofits here? Bloomerang does auto connect with it. I have not used every option. I've used Give Butter before, which is big in the States. I helped this nonprofit in the right. States that was accepting donations through Give Butter. A lot of them are like pretty similar. Some of them weirdly only have one-way connections, I think, where like you can extract data, but you can't always put data back into it, depending on what you're using. Blackwater Race Edge most definitely does not connect with Zapier. I'll let you know. I know that's a pretty common one that a lot of big nonprofits use, including ourselves sometimes, and it does not connect with Zapier. So yeah, no, but I have used Bloomerang before. I've not used every action. And uh, yeah, Give Butter is the other one. And then there's another cool one out of the States which I have not used. I've looked at their platform. I think it's the more common in the U.S. just because all their data right. is stored in the U.S. But there's a good one called DonorDoc, I think is the name of it. And their integrations with Zapier are crazy. You can basically do anything you want. You get in, you, you can update donors, add gifts, I think, automatically using Zapier. You can do a ton of stuff. And their pricing is very cheap. It's $150 a month or something crazy. I think the only disadvantage is if you are a Canadian charity, they store your data in the U.S. But yeah, they have some cool connection. But yeah, no. It, like I said, if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And if no one has other questions for this one. Sure. So I, I've wait. got a couple yeah, questions here. So yeah. yeah, so I think, so yeah, Kylie's question was first linked to this. Yeah, a lot of these platforms often have their own automation engines built into the platform. Oh, oh sorry. I think saying, yes. Thank you. No, I misread that. I was feeding it as an, oh, can you connect with Zapier? So yes. Yeah, so Bloomerang does connect with Zapier. Donor doc does. Give Butter does. I don't know if every action does. Some of them have automations built in. I have tried to use some of them before. So we were on Blackboard Racer's Edge and they have an automation tool built in. Um, and I hated every minute of it because in all honesty, what we wanted to achieve was we wanted it to feel like someone on our team took the time to write an email or save us that time to write that email. And the Blackboard one, I think, was it sent it as a marketing email still. So even if we chose to write an email and send it, it would basically send it as a one-off marketing campaign to that one donor that ended up in the automation. So in my mind, it just seemed like really impractical. The other aspect in terms of using a tool like Zapier or Make is that other one I discussed, which was like, hey, we're just going to pull some data out drop it into a spreadsheet as hilarious as that sounds, let it send an email and then delete it from the spreadsheet. You can't do that with any of the donor tools really easily. Some of them do have connections where I know Donor Perfect, for example, you can connect to Constant Contact. You could build a list in Donor Perfect. It could push it to Constant Contact. That's sweet. When you send the email in Constant Contact, you're still sending a marketing email. And so there is 100% a time and a place for marketing emails. We still use them all the time for general and broad communications, but if you do want to make it feel just a little bit more personal or make it feel like you've taken the time to email someone, you likely are not going to be able to achieve it the way you want. I know even like some of the ones that like you send one-to-one -one emails, so like Blackbaud or Donor Perfect also, I think, which you send one-to-one -one emails through the system, which mm -hmm. then it's the donor record automatically. You still have to be in Blackbaud to do that. So that's still like writing out all those emails one at a time, which is like crazy. So. Yeah, so I'm seeing Kylie following up saying, yeah, so some of these systems are still have the unsubscribe, like it has the experience of, oh, I'm getting an automation. And yeah. it like your recommended hack around that is the semi-automation of everything can export to a CSV file. So you could basically just take a CSV, put it into one of these, like these standing spreadsheets you've got. You haven't run it off the automations through there, delete the content of the spreadsheet, have someone do it again manually the next day. And that's probably... Yeah, that I made mean, for a lot of people. Yeah, that would be an easy one. Or if you just schedule a time in your calendar to run a report every week or something, that's like another easy way to do it. Some tools will let you run reports recurring, and when you right. run the recurring, it can export it to a CSV. So I know Donor Perfect, for example, you can create a report and have it schedule send on a weekly basis, which then would you have to build the initial report. 
So there's some upfront work, but it saves you the time. But the two-step one that you're talking about, Eli, yeah, that one's pretty straightforward because that one, I can probably include a link to that one. I think we might have templatized that one too. But basically all we're doing for that one is I believe our spreadsheet for that one, we keep as simple as possible. And we only have two columns that we care about, email and first name. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. second step, that's the automation email. That is the thing that we go in and update before we upload the data to the spreadsheet. And that's basically like you pre-writing the subject line, the body copy, because you can connect multiple email accounts to Zapier. We will choose what new staff member's email it might be coming from. And then we basically publish it, upload right. the data for the spreadsheet and let it run. And that's like the easier way to do it. But like I said, in those cases, we don't even extract data that like might include address or like giving info for some of these ones. It really is meant to be like an email. And so we only ever extract email <laughs> and first name. Usually you could get more personalized and include like donation information and then make thank you emails that way. If you wanted to, there would be a way to do it, but we've just never wanted to have to try to make it more complicated than it needed to be. In most cases, it's like, hey, we're probably going to send you some sort of briefly generic information. We just didn't want it on an email that was going to get lost. Yeah, so I can totally see how that's going to make your IT and privacy officer much happier <laughs> to say like, only these two columns are even leaving our system. So yeah. don't worry about these third-party tools. Yeah, and in and, and all honesty, when we ran some of the other ones in the past, obviously, if you're creating a list and exporting it out, we will try to exclude people that have opted out of our email communications, obviously. So we're not monsters. I know people, someone when I first did this asked me about its implications as it related to Canadian anti-spam legislation. And I know for nonprofits, it's a little bit more lenient, obviously, because of implied consent when someone makes a donation to you. And like I said, we still try to avoid anyone that's opted out. But essentially what we're doing is we're taking the steps that we would take to email everyone individually and just doing it in bulk for lack of a better term. And as I explained to them, I was like, oh, technically I was going to email this person anyway. So if you can confirm to me that I'm breaking anti-spam legislation, I won't do it this way. But all I was going to do is write the email and press send. I'm just saving myself hours of work doing it. Right. So I just getting a lot of drafts and off you go. So I, Dan, yeah. how do we become a Dan? So help me figure out how I start thinking through Building my own automation, um, do you sit at a whiteboard and with a process flowchart and say, if this, then that? Like, how do you start building yeah, all these jet processes? I do it all by trial and error, as crazy as it sounds. I've built enough of them now that I usually have a rough idea of what's going to work. I do, if you are interested, without having to sign up for Zapier, you can search on Zapier's website for what they connect to. So if you, and it will give you some ideas. And so sometimes I take ideas that they have on there that are for profit businesses and basically I'm just like, oh, we're going to just modify this for ourselves. Like, why do I care if it's for a for profit business? And so usually what I'll do is I'll be like, okay, what applications, what software do we currently use? And I'll just start typing it into Zapier to be like, all right, you're on here. Sweet. What are some of your triggers and actions that you can do? So a trigger in Zapier is anything that kicks off the automation and an action is any of the subsequent steps. So that's one way I do it. The other way that I do it is... Essentially, it's just a lot of asking questions. It's like, why do we do it this way? So just constantly asking yourself why. If, I'm, if I have a process, why do I do it that way? Does this process take me way too long? If the answer is yes, then the simple answer, without knowing how it's going to work, is, okay, can I automate it? And then usually my answer to that question, if someone on my team asks me, is yes. But I don't actually always know if I can automate it, to be perfectly honest with you. I just always say yes and assume that it's going to get automated, even to some of the <laughs> Help. And usually it works out because there's always a way, there's always like software has gotten so good that there's usually a way to make it work. The problem more often than not is that nonprofit software, and it's obviously no offense to TechSoup, but some nonprofit software is lagging behind what for-profit software has developed. And as Kaylee said here, yes, your automation tool, they built an automation tool, which is sweet. It's not going to work how you want it to. Whereas if you use a, I'm trying to think, if you use HubSpot, for example, which has a CRM and email marketing tool, I believe there would be a way within HubSpot to automate one-to-one -one emails, but that is literally built for profit as a sales tool. And so, yeah, if you're willing to adapt some stuff, it, it's pretty easy. Most nonprofits use very similar software, so that's made it a little bit easier. You get the odd one that might be a little unusual that I've never heard of before, but a lot of them do the same stuff. So yeah, the big thing is, in this case, we did donor stuff, but like I said, donor stuff is the easy one. Some of the other ones, it's like, hey, we have a finance process that sucks. Can we make it 
better and then just trying to find a way to do it. Because basically what we want is it's just evaluating what takes you the most time. So no, I don't necessarily whiteboard it. I just think to myself, all right, is there just like a, a better way to do this? Or is there a better tool to do this? As I've learned, thanks to things like TechSoup, most software does have nonprofit rates. If it's a software that's not even on the TechSoup website, for example, I will really always, are. I'll, I'll, I'll always ask for a nonprofit rate. They might not have one listed. And the number of times I'll just email and be like, hey, I'm a nonprofit. What's your discount for us? And usually they'll get right. it. Yeah. And the so, power of yeah. squeaky wheel. Dan, one more question for you. We've all, we're all working in organizations with yeah. legacy platform and technology decision. Yes. But say you were, say you were starting up a small, not 10 working nonprofit right now. You are building out your own tech stack right now without all those legacy decisions around there. What would be your five things that you would start for with? What, what are the, the ones that we know are going to be automatable and not drive you crazy in the future? Okay, so I would use, okay, I would for sure use Gmail over Outlook only because Gmail for nonprofits is definitely free and Outlook still has a small cost. Not that Outlook is any worse. It's just if I'm truly a nonprofit trying to save money and care about donor dollars, I would just pick Gmail. So I would use that one for sure, just from an email standpoint. From an online giving platform standpoint, oh, that's a tough one. I'm so used to using Shopify that part of me wants to say I would use that one because there are apps and stuff that allow you to send tax receipts. I know that's not for everyone. So I might have to come back to that one. In terms of a donor database, I haven't spent enough time in the nonprofit version of it, but I know Salesforce's nonprofit version is like very customizable. And for things like automations, the more customizable, the better. I also know that because it's Salesforce and they're uh, originally built as a for-profit sales tool, they also have a great Zapier connection. Uh, I would use Zapier. So that would be three. I'm trying to think mm -hmm. what else I would use. Hey, Dan, yeah. remember last week, and obviously people in the presentation are work privy to our discussion, but one thing that you shared with me that I wanted to ask is another question to keep the discussion going was you're talking about using which software to yeah. do this. The one that we use to email all of our donors, that one we used was actually Active Campaign. That one's not bad. Right. Active Campaign is like HubSpot. Their pricing used to be really cheap, but I think they recently changed it. So it's a like HubSpot and MailChimp or Constant Contact combined into one. So it has a... It has an email marketing platform, but then it also has a sales component mm -hmm. platform. And the sales component platform is what we use to automate some of our other donor emails because it has a very good built-in automation where you can create a sales deal basically, and then automate where the sales deal is in the funnel of the sales cycle or donation cycle. And by automating where it is in the cycle, whenever a deal switches stages, you could also automate sending an email. And so we basically created a circular automation that would just swap deals between two stages. So every time it switched stages, it would just send an email. So every 30 days, it would switch stages automatically and email would send. So we would just have to go into the system, update that email every 30 days or at the start of every month. And then all of our donors would basically just get a new email from us about upcoming stuff that we had been working on or pool hospital news that maybe they would have missed in our marketing email. Honestly, a lot of the content was stuff we had already sent them. We just now sent it in a different one-to-one -one format the more of them read it and it, it because of how it worked it didn't have any tracking so we couldn't necessarily see open rates for example but sometimes we would put questions in there to get donors to answer and then donors would email us back so it basically created like our um cycle to try and talk to donors more in a lot of ways so that that was not bad 